I'll go ahead and, and introduce the lecture series. This is known as the Lowry Lectures, and they were established in 1971 through a generous gift from Della Campbell Lowry. The lectures are named for the Reverend Virgil and Della Campbell Lowry. Um, it's noted in the Purple Book, officially known as A History of Memphis Theological Seminary, <clears throat> 1852 to 1990. That Della, along with her husband Virgil, rendered a long life of rich and full service to the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Further, Della taught Greek at Cumberland College for a number of years, and in recognition of her work in that area, these lectures have traditionally focused on New Testament scholarship. So we welcome everybody to the Lowry Lectures. Uh, a tradition at Memphis Theological Seminary since the early 1970s. Thanks so much, Dean Gatke. And again, welcome to everyone. So good to be with you all this evening. Uh, it's my joy to do, to do the introduction of our guests tonight. And so I want to address Reverend Dr. Smith and get out the way, even here virtually, so we can hear from her and her brilliance here this evening. So the Reverend Dr. Shively T.J. Smith is a scholar. She spent over 20 years in the study of Bible, theology, and religion, and is a New Testament professor and director of the PhD program at Boston University School of Theology. A summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Fisk University, she earned master's degrees from the Candler School of Theology at Emory University and Columbia Theological Seminary. She has studied abroad in the theology department at Oxford University and as an English speaking Union Luard scholar and holds a PhD in New Testament studies from Emory University. Dr. Smith is also a writer, having authored two books, Strangers to Family, Diaspora, and First Peter's Invention of God's Household, released in 2016 by Baylor University Press, and Interpreting Second Peter Through African American Women's Moral Writings in 2023, so this year. She's written various numerous essays, including Witnessing Jesus, Witnessing Jesus Hang, a womanist reading of Mary Magdalene's view of the crucifixion through Ida B. Wells' Chronicles of Lynching. She's also a regular contributor to the Working Preacher Lectionary Series and other online and print lectionary publications. Dr. Smith is also a preacher. Preaching since the age of 16, she's proclaimed the gospel as far as South Korea and the UK and across the United States. She's an itinerant elder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, serving as a resident scholar of the historic Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, D.C. Dr. Smith is also a teacher who shared her expertise across various communities and traditions. She's appeared on as an expert commentary on the History Channel documentary, Jesus, His Life, and on scholarly panels broadcast on C-SPAN, and also presented at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And last but not least, Reverend Dr. Smith is also a product of church and family communities across the country, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Georgia to be exact. He's a fourth generation preacher, who along with her spouse are the parents of two girls. She enjoys good music, food, movies, laughs, and friends. We would get along there. Uh, Dr. Smith says at her core, she's a bookworm and writer who happens to look up from her books once in a while to speak a thing or two. She hopes that her words, smiles, and love for all God's people will encourage others. So most only folks here, let's welcome Dr. Smith as she shares with us during the 2023 Lowry Lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Blount, for that. I'm going to share my screen and then we will begin. All right. So first, let me share my gratitude with President Hill, Dean Gapke, and, the, and Dr. Blount, and the entire Memphis Theological Seminary community and this 2023 Lowry Lectureship Virtual Forum. There is much in my research and work these days that I draw upon, but this evening, I want to focus attention on casting 19th century African-American women writers as biblical scholars. This grows out of my current research focus as presented in my recent book publication this year, Interpreting Second Peter Through African-American Women's moral writing. So you get to have a little bit of a taste of some of the work that I'm doing there uh, in this book. So thank you so much for having me. Where we start 
and with whom we start the work of interpreting the Bible in terms of text, context, language, experience, and even configurations of approaches matters. If you have visited a museum or a mall or a walking trail, you probably have seen a map like this. There are a lot of places one can be on starting their journey on that map, but paying attention to where we are on the map in contrast to where we want to go, make some paths, directions, landmarks more likely on our journey than others. If we wanna head east on this map, the signpost and landmarks on the west side may never come into view or even be imagined by us. There is no automatic starting point of biblical interpretation, although there is a traditional starting point that does not include a particular group of interpreters and their approaches, methods, and commitments in studying the biblical text and specifically the New Testament. So what happens? When we start our interpretive work with the biblical histories and interpretive practices of women like Anna Julia Cooper, Maria Stewart, Virginia Broughton, and Zilpha Elaw, and others. When we begin with African-American biblical interpreters, specifically African-American women's sites of biblical interpretation from the 19th century, the fundamental assumptions and the existential understandings of the biblical writings, and in my case, the New Testament in particular, can and do shift. Largely ignored in standard treatments of American biblical interpretation, none of which currently reference the women I just mentioned. And I'm thinking here of some of these reference volumes that we have in our libraries, Dictionary of Biblical Interpretation, Historical Handbook of Major Biblical Interpreters, the History of New Testament Research, and on and on. None of these 19th century African-American women writers are named as exemplars of, of particular strands in biblical interpretive history in these texts. Compared to their counterparts, however, be it white American women and men or African American men, this group of African American women participating in the larger literary production of the 19th century are nonetheless biblical interpreters, albeit a small number of people. Frances Smith Foster, a pioneer in African-American women's literary tradition describes these women in her book, Written by Herself, in these terms, quote, the extant literature from 1746 to 1892, albeit small in quantity, proves that African-American women, like African-American men, deliberately chose to participate in the public discourse despite considerable Anglo-American resistance to their doing so. They appropriated the English literary tradition to reveal, to interpret, to challenge, and to change perceptions of themselves and the world in which they found themselves. The women we are talking about in this group are writers, and biblical interpreters. They include other people like Jarena Lee, Ida B. Wells, Maria Stewart, Julia A.J. Foote, Zilpha Elaw, as I named above, Sojourner Truth, and others. Whereas Foster locates these women primarily in the period up to 1892, I purposely include the entirety of the 1890s because you get key works such as Ida B. Wells' 1895 anti-lynching published research known as A Red Record, or more regionally significant for Memphis Theological Seminary, you get Virginia Broughton's first autobiogra autobiographical publication in the same year, in 1895, titled, quote, A Brief Sketch of the Life and Labors of Mrs. Virginia W. Broughton, 
Bible Band Missionary for Middle and West Tennessee. Their literature, be it essays, opinion editorials, spiritual autobiographies, and transcripts of public addresses transmits a biblical ethic of interpretation and use that requires liberation from all forms of personal, communal, and systemic domination and oppression. A sampling of any of their extant writings recalls the horrors of federally instituted enslavement and the hope of the Civil War victory for liberation and inclusion as full citizens in the homeland of their birth. 19th century African-American women's writings speak to the new disappointment accompanying the premature disinvestiture of reconstruction efforts and the abandonment of the United States newly constituted Christian African-American citizenry to rogue Christian white supremacist forms of Southern redemption justice. White redemptionist actors under the banner of biblical readers and Christians took aim at black communities, particularly their Bible reading Christian communities that threatened to become too prominent, too successful, too independent and too free. African-American women writing in the 19th century addressed the multiple traumas of their community over a hundred year period and they champion cultural responses of hope and concrete social transformation using the biblical text, the gospel, as their guide. The first task in learning from past African-American women biblical interpreters their approaches is retrieving their biblical interpretive writings and habits in the first place. As I mentioned, these women are not mentioned, are not named, they do not have entries in the standard biblical studies, New Testament dictionaries, reference volumes that lay out biblical interpreters, particularly from the 19th and um, 20th century. So, uh, there's a, a work of retrieval that has to happen because you just don't have them nice and ready and talked about in these our go-to places in New Testament and biblical studies. This retrieval process entails identifying the sites of biblical interpretive knowledge that have gone unnoticed on the global map of biblical interpretation generally, but American and European focused critical biblical studies specifically to explore the title of my lecture today, the sites of biblically literate 19th century African-American women writers requires weighing matters of both number one, reception history of biblical texts, particularly for us New Testament texts, which means how the texts are received. And then hermeneutics, the practices and habits of interpreting Howard Thurman, Howard Thurman would talk about it as identifying the meaning and significance of the text for the reading community. To this end, I ask the question of what are the defining characteristics of 19th century African-American women writers, interpreter, interpretive projects, and how did they interpret biblical writings similarly and differently from not only their European American contemporaries, but also from interpreters within their own African American Bible reading communities. For a few moments, with my time that I have, <laughs> for a few moments, I wanna consider some sites in which privileging historic African American women's biblical interpretive practices and engagement from the 19th century shift what we might assume or even look for in critical studies of the Bible by considering the theme of the multivocality of New Testament writings encountered through sites of 19th century African-American women's biblical interpretive endeavor. The multivocality of New Testament writings encountered through the sites of 19th century African-American women's biblical interpretive endeavors. <laughs> 
Considering the multivocality of the New Testament writings means noticing the related yet diverse voices and perspectives the 27 writings of early Christianity provide us. What is typically not hard for people to grant is that we have 27 writings of the New Testament and that each writing represents a particular perspective, contextual moment in history, sociality, and rhetoric that we have a New Testament chorus, so to speak, comprised of 27 members, and they can be divided into anywhere between four to six major, major genres or types of writings, the gospels, history, book of Acts, the letters, the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And what people often miss or gloss over is the fact that we actually have homilies or essays when we look at the writing of Hebrews and 1 John. And we also have testamental letters when we look at 2 Peter and 2 Timothy. I always love this in the standard introductions to the New Testament these days, where we're, we talk about there being 21 letters. And then you get to just go look at any of introduction. They'll, they'll say that broadly in the introduction, and then you get to the specific chapter or section treatment on, say, Hebrews, and immediately that letter designation gets tossed out, and you end up hearing this pivot that says, well, it's really more of an early homily or an essay, right? And so I just like to say it up front. <laughs> <laughs> that fundamentally when we deal with the 27 writings, yes, we have major genres of gospels. Yes, we have history. Yes, we have letters. Yes, we have apocalypse. But we do have early examples of sermonic writing, homilies and essays and um, testament letters. When you look at 2 P Peter and 2 Timothy, and we think about the ways in which those seem to be written from the dying patriarch of Peter and Paul to communities or to Timothy, it sounds a little bit like what you see in the farewell discourse of John, um, what we see happening in Jacob's last words in Genesis 48, 49, what we see happening as a farewell discourse and Moses' blessings of the tribes um, in Deuteronomy 32 and 33. So again, just a little bit of a configuration piece, piece there. So it's not hard to see that in these 27, this 27 member chorus we call the New Testament, no, we don't have a section called the sopranos, the altos, the tenors, and the bass, but we do have sections called the gospels, history, letters, apocalypse, homilies, and testament. What is typically harder to grasp, and it's becoming more and more a working presumption among New Testament scholars, is the understanding that each individual writing itself is not merely the creation of a lone individual, but it represents communities forging particular Christian identities and expressions that are not an exact replica of the so-called Christian community or church or assembly next door. <laughs> Denise Kimber Buell argues in her book, Why This New Race? Ethnic Reasoning in Early Christianity for a new term called Christianness. It's a term in which she uses to capture the diverse and broad expressions of Christian community identities that we see, some of which are contested, some of which are mediated, some of which are pushed out altogether. The idea is that each writing comes from and is created for communities of Christian identity or Christianness that are networked and linked and that see themselves as a new community and even a new race or ethnic people by their sheer diversity and number that now consider that new diverse community with this particular sets of belief and practices a new people under God. Now this notion takes seriously the peoplehood making elements of the early Jesus movement communities as expressed in places like Acts chapter one, verse eight, that says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
take seriously places such as first Peter chapter two, verse nine, that says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Particular geographical and cultural identities even land attachments and histories are not wiped away by Christian location, but are recast through the Jesus movement's belief and functionality as a new people. We see actually an instance of this biblical interpretive site in the work of someone like Virginia Broughton. After quoting 1 Peter 2, 9 as saying from the King James Version, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Broughton interprets that passage to mean, quote, when God called out a peculiar people for himself, he made choice of the mother of Israel. Choice and mother are capitalized by Broughton in, in, in our work. So that's yet another interpretive move to actually choose when to capitalize and what to capitalize in, um, in, in this sort of italicized form. In 1894, Broughton emerged as a leading woman's rights advocate within the Baptist tradition, actually right in Tennessee. Born to enslaved parents during the latter part of the 19th century, Broughton received her higher education at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, before assuming her role as educator, activist, and writer. She had firsthand experience with how biblical rhetoric of submission aimed at the bodies of women and brown people was deployed to erase the humanity and value of her family, communities, and herself. Rather than rejecting First Peter altogether because of its exhortation to enslave people and women to stay and submit, Broughton looked elsewhere in the letter, adopting a different set of petrine literary forms and norms. So what's important here is that in First Peter, starting in chapter 2, verse 11, up to 3, 7, we have one of the formal household codes of the New Testament. And that a household code is using, particularly as it addresses enslaved people, the language, hupatazo, language of submission or authority over. It addresses enslaved ones. It addresses uh, women, wives, married to uh, non-Christian husbands. It addresses uh, believing husbands. Um, it does not address. It does not address governors or uh, 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 the emperor directly, though it names him. It does not address uh, uh, the demographic of the enslavers themselves, the enslaving class itself. So this household code is a very interesting code because it's not as a balanced of a household code in pairs as we're used to seeing in the Pauline, Pauline writings. And Broughton does not avoid the use of this text. She just goes elsewhere to source what is Inspir what is what is inspired, what is um, biblically and interpretively useful for understanding God, her community, and using the New Testament text in First Peter. She published in the National Baptist Magazine an address she gave at the National Baptist Educational and Foreign Mission Convention in 1893, where she alludes to and in, reinterprets imagery from 1 Peter. Instead of the prescriptive rhetoric exhibited in the household codes of 1 Peter 2, 11 through 3, 3, 7, Broughton embraced the metaphorical language of 1 Peter and its interpretive task of redefinition and identity politics in 2, 9. Broughton followed the agenda of the letter, which is to reflect upon and strategize the relationship between the identity of the believers, especially those most vulnerable and exposed in the world, those that fit what Thurman would talk about as the disinherited class of people, and the proclamation of Jesus' suffering and death as relevant for them. 
using her embodiment as an African-American Christian woman, Broughton used First Peter to assert not only the divine affirmation of African bodies in America and the world, but also the bodies and agency of all women, Jews and Christians, and the entirety of God's creation. Consequently, she upset conventional readings of First Peter in the 19th century that use this letter as an inspired, so-called inspired text by God to assert African-Americans and women were lesser than their white American men by exercising a hermeneutics of selection and an early form of what Sally McFay would, la would later call metaphorical theology. Broughton used First Peter to make a different statement about God's created order and the power of women and all God's creation to interpret the Bible for themselves and for their communities, all the while point the way of pointing or choosing where to go in the text and where not to go in the text. So what's so important here as a site of interpretation and multivocality is to recognize that even within a biblical text itself, a particular writing, someone like Virginia Broughton, right here from ten right from Tennessee itself, right? So we can use the text, but we can choose where in the text is our starting point for understanding what is the inspired word of God. What is interpretively and socially, theologically necessary for our interpretive practices and our gospel proclamation? Another site. Another site for biblically literate 19th century African-American women writers engaging in the multivocality of the biblical text and the New Testament is located in the 1819 publication journey of Jarena Lee's spiritual autobiography titled The Life and Religious Experience of Jarena Lee, a colored lady giving an account of her call to preach the gospel. And then Jarena Lee ends up producing a revised version version of that 1819 version in 1836. So it was a revised and expanded version. So either one, what you end up seeing is um, an example of what I have here on the screen. Uh, on the screen. A strong current in historical reconstruction uh, a strong current in the historical reconstruction and New Testament epistolary studies right now is the idea that no writing and no writer of the New Testament is a lone actor. Every letter, even when only a single person is named as the author or a single person is named as the intended recipient, always must be understood within a larger community context and community formation that is making a new sort of peoplehood and kinship legible. Even when we attribute a writing to a lone writer, that they typically signal that they are participating, those biblical writers, or in this case, letter writers, are typically signaling that they are participating in a larger tradition and conversation. One of my favorite examples is 1 Corinthians 15, 3, where Paul says, I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn have received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And then he goes on and you end up getting this really early creedal statement that comes from Paul that's about Christ's death and resurrection and appearances. It's really, really important as we think about early Christian, early creedal formations in Christianity that we see attested to in the New Testament. So again, Paul, even though Paul is the writer of Corinthians, Paul himself says, I can't write without signaling that what I'm writing is not of me, but it is a part of a larger community tradition and belief and practice that has ethical implications for the Corinthian community, social implications for the Corinthian community, identity implications uh, for the Corinthian community. Another example is from the Gospel of Luke itself in chapter 1, verse 1, that says, since many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, 
I too decided as one having a grasp of everything from the start to write a well-ordered well account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So again, we see Luke signaling that the, even the gospel that's being written that we call the gospel of Luke is participating in a larger community literary form, a literary production form, in fact, um, that he is aware of, that he has researched, that he's been formed by, even as he is contributing to it. Look at this. This idea of a religious tradition of lone actors becomes more and more dispelled, not only when we look at the biblical text, another place to look would be Romans 1.1, 1, 1, but also when viewed through the missionary and social activist endeavors of 19th century African-American women writers. Um, it becomes more and more ahistorical to talk about the single New Testament writer inspired by nothing else but themselves and the spirit that, that visits them by candlelight. <laughs> For example, someone like Jerena Lee, the first recognized woman preacher of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, attests to a greater communal endeavor in her work um, when she says, quote, in 1836, I traveled, get, get this, in 1836, I traveled 556 miles and preached 11 sermons and felt under much exercise to print a book. And I had some friends to encourage me. And every circumstance was so favorable that I finally succeeded. And when they were brought home, I sat down in the house and wondered, how should I pass them out? To sell them appears too much like merchandise. The notion of a community support, commissioning, and request for literary production is not merely exceptional, but necessary. When you consider a letter like Romans, um, the cost somewhere between um, um, typical average uh, estimates are 2,000 to 3,000. I even heard one scholar go as high as 5,000 to produce. So think about how expensive the letter of Romans was uh, uh, to produce. At the very least, the matter of literary sponsorship and patronage is unearthed when we consider the matter of communal literary production of the New Testament writings through the historical lens of someone like Jarena Lee. So even if you say, yeah, but it was authored by Paul, yes, but Paul needed support in some way to be able to not only write an expensive letter like that, but to give it legs <laughs> so that it travels and then continues to travel, right? So um, the communal production endeavor, the communal, the necessity of communal uh, sponsorship, commissioning, signing off, validation, patronage, this is a part of understanding the New Testament canon and its story, as it is assigning authorial identity to the writings themselves. Related to this is how Lee markets the relevance of her, autobiog her autobiography with the inclusion of Joel 228's passage on the title page. So here you have a scanned copy of the title page. And right there, at the bottom as epithet, uh, you have Lee including this as sort of the framing idea of her whole spiritual autobiography. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old, man, your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Um, and then, and it, uh, I love how she goes on. Uh, and, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy is really, really important for her there. What I want to, why am I pulling that out? One of the other sites that you see here in Jarena Lee's model autobiography is the necessity of um, adapt, adopting and adapting, what I call a reappropriation, a reappropriation that corrects social malformations is what Lee is up to when she uses this Joel 228 quote, which does include specifically the language of daughters in it. So she could have gone in any number of places, but she went to the place among the prophets, 
that explicitly identifies sons and daughters as those that are, are given to prophecy, the spirit moves upon. So it represents a sort of way of engaging the inspired word in the mode of selection. Where you go, we're back to our map again, where you begin and where you are headed in the study of the New Testament matters for these women. Just because it is a site that's possible on the map doesn't mean it's a site, according to these women, that we use now. I want to keep going, recognizing my time. Let me help. Let me do one more, one more site and then I'll wrap it up. One more site that's my favorite. And I think it's going to work quite nicely for the Lowry lectures here, because here we get to talk about, and I heard Dean get Getry talk about um, translation and the work of Greek. This is a translation matter in understanding the multivocality of the New Testament. So another matter in New Testament studies in a place of multivocality that becomes important when viewed through sites from biblically literate 19th century African-American women writers is the matter of biblical translation. No writings of the Bible exist in its autograph form, and the lang in the languages of the Bible are Hebrew, Aramaic, and the New Testament Koine Greek, uh, which means a fundamental step in biblical interpretation is translation. As one scholar states it, it can be safely assumed that every translation ever done of the biblical text exhibits a definite ideology whether conscious or unconscious, and the factors contributing to translation ideologies or worldviews include realities of race, class, gender, life histories, theological persuasions, political alliances, cultural distinctives, end quote. So paying attention to matters of translation means paying attention to interpretation and its social implications and influence. What does that translation do among people? I always like to start very insider with the believing community. One scenario from the biblically literate 19th century African-American women archive that I find very helpful you know, on the matters of interpretation and translation is Julia A.J. Foote. Foote, barely on the other side of the short-lived reconstruction effort and during the rise of redemption campaign efforts to repeal citizenship rights through Jim Crow segregation, Foote publishes her 1879 spiritual autobiography titled A Brand Plucked from the Fire. In it, she challenges the sexism and patriarchy within her African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church community and provides a reconstruction of early Christian origins informed by her particular social realities, standing at odds with the community's prevailing assumptions about the place of women's leadership in church and society Foot confronted resistance to women's ordination using a sophisticated and eclectic exegetical strategy. She combined methods from literary, historical, and existential approaches to the Bible as she composed a position on the legitimacy of women's ecclesial authority. I love this quote in her book, in her um, in her autobiography, because I see it so helpful and impactful in considering this. Foote says, but the Bible puts an end to this strife when it says, there is neither male nor female in Christ Jesus. Philip had four daughters that prophesied or preached. Paul called Priscilla as well as Aquila, his quote unquote helper, helper or as in the Greek, his fellow laborer. The same word, which in our common translation is now rendered a servant of the church in speaking of Phoebe in Romans 16, 1, is rendered quote unquote minister when applied to Tychicus in Ephesians 6, 21. And in the early ages of Christianity, many women were happy and glorious in martyrdom. How nobly 
how heroically, too, in later ages, have women suffered persecution and death for the name of the Lord Jesus. I love this here. Foote's reconstruction of women's leadership in early Jesus movements exhibits her knowledge of canonical and non-canonical Christian writings. So Foote is um, um, demonstrating not only just reading the New Testament, the early Christian literature, they canonized in the New Testament, but reading beyond it, reading within the larger archive, early Christian history to get the stories that we don't see there, particularly the martyrologies is what she's pointing to here. Um, um, so what does it mean to go beyond it? Foot is also, also employs literary analysis and theological exegesis probing the final form of New Testament texts like Acts chapter 1 verses 12 and 14. In doing so, she is attentive to demographic information about early Christian communities represented in the writings. But moreover, her interpretation, Foote's interpretation, discloses a facility with linguistic and discourse analysis that investigates the Greek language behind the King James Version. She questions the politics of translation, legitimating an inequitable, inequitable power dynamic between women and men in her Christian community by contrasting, calling into question even, how the translation is uneven and how it renders the same Greek term in Ephesians 6.21 when applied to what appears to be a male disciple, uh, a male disciple of Jesus, um, a male disciple following Paul, as opposed to how that same term is rendered when applied to a female disciple in Paul's Paul's camp. So what is she pointing to here? So here in Ephesians 6.21, I, I always use... Uh, um, the New King James Version, because, you know, Dr. Blunt, it seems like some of my students now, they gloss over the thous and the things. <laughs> so Ephesians 6.21, but, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychus, a beloved brother and faithful minister, diakonos is the Greek word there, in the Lord, will make all things known to you compared to, let's see if we can get it, compared to Romans 16, 1 on Phoebe, I commend to you, Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant, diakonos, same Greek word of the church in, in Sincrea. What I love about this is foot shows you that she is not just re reading the received English translation, she is reading the Greek behind the translation. Um, and one of the things that this does that I find very powerful, and I'm going to wrap up here, Dr. Blanc, is I also think it begins to dispel some of the most pernicious uh, and ugly stigmas um, that uh, that are received, um, that are circulating in the 19th century about particularly particular embodied biblical interpreters um, that say certain groups are better and have a facility with languages as opposed to others. And here you have foot demonstrating that not only does she have facility with the biblical languages, she has a facility that allows her to question the dominant received translations and therefore its interpretation and appropriation within her respective community. In conclusion, examining the writings of 19th century African-American women writers supply us with four things that I like to talk about and have tried to demonstrate actually in short form here. They supply us with descriptive criteria for how we describe the New Testament writings. Um, they describe, they provide us conceptual categories for what are we looking for? What are the concepts, the themes, the metaphors that we're paying attention to and looking looking for as we study the New Testament? They, just, they, they provide us rhetorical models for what becomes ways of not just writing interpret um, ways and strategies for writing interpretations of the New Testament, something that my book goes into that I didn't go into here, for instance, is the is the utility of pseudonymity versus anonymity um, and the ways in which pseudonymity has a different meaning and function for these 19th century women in a way that can really challenge the matter of pseudonymity in epistolary studies in New Testament, um, in New Testament these days, how we even 
think about it and talk about it. And then the fourth, um, and the fourth aspect that these women supply is an emphasis and de-emphasis in biblical citation and the valuing of the biblical canon so that they they take us different places and lift up other places of New Testament writings as we see saw in First Peter with Virginia Broughton that uh, we miss or that gets eclipsed by other readings that have more prominence and more dominance in place um, in the histories or annals of New Testament biblical studies. And so what I want to fund fundamentally say is it matters. Let me see if I can get there. I'm going to go back very quickly to this, to my slide. It matters where you are when you open the New Testament writing, who is with you when you open it, and where you want to go with it. These 19th century African-American women raise up and lift up for us the real uh, necessity of evaluating not only where we start our New Testament studies, but with whom are we starting our study and practices of interpreting the New Testament. Thank you.